Hi, I'm Claire Guest and I'm Chief Executive and Director of Operations of the charity Medical Detection Dogs. We were formerly known as Cancer and Biodetection Dogs because our work started in the detection of human cancer. Our first dogs were trained to detect bladder cancer from a small urine sample. But from this time we've started to realise that virtually every human disease and bacteria has a unique odour and that a dog can be trained to recognise this odour and when useful can be trained to alert to it. So in addition to our team of cancer detection dogs and biodetection dogs, we also now have a programme of medical assistance dogs. And these are dogs trained like a guide dog, they go everywhere with the person. But instead of guiding a person with a visual impairment, our dogs are trained to recognise the specific odour that occurs just before this person has a medical emergency. We choose dogs that are very bonded, perhaps even dogs that in a normal situation might be described as having mild separation disorder. Dogs that want to sit with you, they want to be with you. Because obviously if you're having a low blood sugar and your dog sitting in the bottom of the garden in the sunshine and you're upstairs in the bedroom having a low blood sugar vent, then it's not going to work. Most of our clients would have had hyperglycemic events every week, every day. Many of them were calling out the ambulance once or twice a week and having uh, hospital admissions every month. When they have their blood sugar dog placed with them, once the dog start, starts working, these people have no hospital admissions. They have no paramedic call outs. It's a complete change. We have 10 biodetection dogs, dogs trained to detect different odours on the carousel, where the dogs are trained to walk around and look at each odour in turn. We have two cancer detection dogs and have a further three in training. And Joby, when he's a little bit older, will be being trained as a breast cancer detector dog. But he will detect breast cancer not from urine, but from a breath tube. So from the tube that we use when we collect um, blood sugar odour, we're going to use the same tubes from, and ask people with breast cancer to blow on these tubes and find out whether the dogs can tell the difference between somebody who has breast cancer and somebody who hasn't. So we have, we have these dogs and we have, in addition, we have 27 placed medical assistance dogs now. And we have 20 in puppy walking and five dogs in advanced training. So we're growing incredibly fast, but really not growing quickly enough because we have two main major cancer detection projects for next year. And we also have a waiting list of nearly four years now for our medical assistance dogs. Now this is clearly too long. If you're a child with a life-threatening condition, four years is a lifetime. And for many of our very unwell clients, sadly they may not be alive in four years' time. So we have to make a huge commitment to trying to um, increase um, the number of dogs we train as, as quickly as we can. Whilst of course always bearing in mind that the dogs have to be trained to the right standard and the dogs have to be happy and enjoy doing their work. There's so much potential in this work and we're looking at trying to raise funds as quickly as we can in order to ensure that we can help these people on our waiting list. So in terms of the cancer detection, our early study showed that dogs were able to detect human bladder cancer with an accuracy of 56%. But work has really developed since that point and there have been improvements in accuracy rates. In fact, research around the world that indicates that some dogs may be able to detect certain cancers up to 90 to 95% accuracy. We published last year in the Journal of Cancer Biomark for low grade and stage tumours, so these are the early grade and stage tumours, before the cancer has become too, too large, the dogs were actually more accurate. And in fact, one of our dogs had a reliability of 100% for low grade and stage tumours. Now, his accuracy dropped to 63% for later grade and stage tumours. And you may wonder why that is, but I think we do understand when you're training a dog to detect cancer, what you're doing is you're teaching him to detect one odour pattern, one odour signature, in amongst thousands of others. And what you're doing is you're teaching him that all those other things in urine or in breath are irrelevant. They, you ignore them, they're background odour. What you're looking for is a specific group of, of, of odours. Now, of course, when a tumour is new, it's probably that these, these, these new odours stand out quite strongly. But as the tumour grows, the body starts to respond in a whole range of ways. The person may become an, have an infection, they may have bleeding, they may have other cells developing, they may have a whole range of other conditions occurring because of the tumour. 
And I think this almost masks it. And that's the impression the dogs give. As the tumour gets bigger, it becomes harder to find. But this, of course, is very good news. It means that our cancer dogs can make a real contribution to the detection of cancer in the future. Because if they could only detect the cancer at a very late stage, then you might wonder, well, how much use that will be. But because the dogs can detect it early, you can see how this may be applied in the future. So it may well be that in years to come, our dogs will be redundant and may be working on other, on other conditions because the scientists may have discovered how to uh, develop an electronic system that will look for these volatiles that occur with an early grading stage tumour. With our diabetes detection dogs, when our dogs are out working with clients, they have a very, very high reliability um, in the mid-90%. Paramedic call-outs are reduced from many a year to nothing, so it's very easy to see the impact the dog's having. But we're also just about to publish a new study which is looking at the range of blood sugars and whether or not the person has a less tendency to run their blood sugars high, so they weren't running into dangerously high blood sugars. This has a huge impact on that person's life. So of course money is, is, is always needed by a small charity and um, we're very lucky we have low overheads because of our size. To train a dog, uh, whether it's a cancer dog or a biodetection or a medical detection dog, costs in the region of £5,000. Now that's to find the dog and train the dog to recognise that specific odour. If it's been placed as a medical assistance dog, that will cost in the region of another £5,000. So our medical assistance dogs would cost £10,000. And that's because, of course, a lot of the time following the training of the dog is spent working with the client and their family, interviewing the family and ensuring that the family is, is trained and recognises how the dog is going to alert them and is able to care for the dog appropriately. But th that cost is a real cost to us, so it covers the whole cost of the dog. And to run a, a cancer detection dog for a year, once he's trained, costs in the region of £1,000. So if you think for the work that that dog is able to do, it's a tiny amount in the impact these dogs are having in, in, in cancer detection. And very interesting, we have a dog actually working currently in, in Italy, and we go out to Italy a lot. It's working in a hospital in Italy. It's been trained by ourselves, but we have a hospital in Italy that they're very um, keen to develop this work. And they have a lot of elderly patients. The dogs are, this dog is able to screen um, for early cancers in these patients. Now this is a, an early stage and I don't know whether we'll ever have a dog working in this way in the UK but we are learning so much from it because these, this dog is able to, to screen urine samples and breath samples that come straight down from a ward and we're able to see the difference when a dog is able to screen a new sample as opposed to a sample that's been frozen for many months. As a charity we place all our dogs free of charge and we have a system where we're always trying to help the people who are most needy. So those people that have very brittle conditions that are unable to live a normal lifestyle. But we do encourage everybody to support the charity as much as possible because of course this is vital for our growth and development. So whilst we don't make a charge, we do ask people to assist in any way they can in, in assisting and helping us in fundraising or perhaps going to local funders to see if they can get some support from their local Rotaries or Lions Clubs. We've been very lucky when you think that we started in a recession, probably not the best idea. We've been really, really lucky because we have managed to grow and develop um, in the way that we'd hoped. It's never as quick as you might, might want, but we have managed to continue to expand. And this is because of the support of so many people. We have the support of many trusts and foundations and corporates who, who sponsor dogs. And we have many volunteers out there raising funds for us on a daily basis. Without all these people, we couldn't do the work that we do. All our dogs are fed by Royal Canin, so we, we don't have any concern about feeding costs. And we have support from so many different people. It's important for our future that we continue to be successful in fundraising. In my second study, uh, I was looking um, at uh, prostate and bladder cancer from a urine sample. Daisy is our best cancer detection dog. And while I was training her for this study, when I took her out for a walk one day, I lifted up the back of my car, and instead of jumping out of the car, she jumped up at me, and it's quite unusual. As she did so, I felt this bruised feeling, and I didn't think any more of it. But this bruised feeling didn't go away, so um, in the end, I sort of 
thought that I could feel a bit of a lump, so I went to my to my GP. My GP agreed that they could feel a bit of a lump, so they sent me to a consultant. To cut a long story short, I had a huge number of biopsies and tests, and the core biopsy showed that I had a very, very deep breast cancer, so deep that the surgeon that operated on me said that if it hadn't been discovered, my prognosis would have been extremely poor, because by the time it had been felt, it would have spread very rapidly. So not only have I seen how important cancer detection dogs are in the way in which they're going to assist in the development of new cancer screening from a breath or urine sample, but also from a first-hand experience, I now understand the process of cancer, the process of cancer treatment, the operations, the surgery, the lymph node removal, the radiotherapy, and you know as you're going through that process that your best chance of survival comes from an early diagnosis. And that's actually what makes the difference. And that's inspired me to continue the work. And in fact, over the years, there have been times where the medical assistance dog work has been so busy that it would almost be easy to sort of to, 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 to not continue with the cancer detection, where the work's harder and it's harder to actually get support. But I believe that we've really got something important to learn here and in the future we will be going into the, to doctor surgeries and being screened for cancer biomarkers I'm sure by giving breath samples and the machines will do what the fat daisy did for me and they will hopefully save thousands of lives. Mm -hmm.